One day we will see that we have not followed cunningly devised fables, but truly the revealed word and will of God that has to take place and will take place. For what God intended to do, this he also performs. It was announced that at Easter we will be in Krefeld. It falls on the last weekend, but we have brought Zurich forward on the fourth Sunday of the month, so that we can be here at the last weekend. And we hope and expect that many will come to be blessed with us. The same applies to Pentecost, if we are still here, then we expect a large number of brothers from overseas who will be here with us during that time. Today one has to say, the Lord willing and we are still here. One does not know when for you or for me the last hour comes or when it comes in general that we are all taken up to be with the Lord. I would like to read two scriptures before I then read from the sermon of Brother Brenham from Psalms 125 Psalms 125 They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth even forever. For the rod of the wicked shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous, lest the righteous put forth their hands unto iniquity. Do good, O Lord, unto those that be good, and to them that are upright in their hearts. As for such as turn aside unto their crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them forth with the workers of iniquity, but peace shall be upon Israel. Especially the first and the third verse. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abideth forever. He who really believes does not stagger to and fro. He finds his position and takes his stand. He is put upon the rock and is unmovable as the rock upon which he stands. He who has not built on sand, but who has put his trust in the Lord, he is firm as Mount Zion, which does not move, but which stands forever. And then verse 3. For the scepter of the wicked shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous. Also this we mentioned in these past meetings, that God, everything, what belonged to the church at the beginning and what was laid into her, by grace he will restore it. For this is contained in the restoration that God's word promised, and of which we have heard already much. The second scripture from James, Brother Brenham comes in this sermon straight to Job. We mentioned this man of God in connection with the restoration already a couple of times. In James 5, From verse 10 we read, Take, my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Verse 11, 
Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Whom shall we take for an example? The prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Also they had to endure and mostly they didn't see of what they were speaking of but they were convinced that the moment would come in which everything is fulfilled what God has spoken through their mouth. Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. In Hebrews we read of a great cloud of witnesses of which we are compassed about. Witnesses who can testify of that, what God promised and what he fulfilled. Then it says here of Job that we have heard of the patience of Job and of the end which the Lord prepared for him. Not that he got something under control, not the end which he elegantly has prepared, but which the Lord prepared for him. We one day come to the point where we have no influence on the circumstances, where we totally depend on God. And this was Job. Job sat on an ash heap that was left behind of all what was burned down. Where was his hope? What should he do? Incapable of working, laced with sore boils, he sat there on an ash heap and he struggled to get a little relief. Outwardly, a hopeless case. And whoever passed by had either compassion or was shaking his head, maybe giving a good advice, but nobody helped him. But God has seen the trouble, God has seen the misery, the condition. And when the hour came, God has answered, He has spoken, He acted, and already the end was in a majestic way prepared and took its course. I would like to refer this to the Church, to whom the promises were given. What is left behind does not bother us. God can do great things where there is nothing beyond our asking and understanding. He has made the plan and this plan is carried out. I read the last sentence of the last passage which I read already this morning and then I continue. The law of God by the Holy Spirit brings any promise to pass regardless of the conditions in which we are in. Job said, Though the skin worms destroy my body, yet in my flesh I will see God. Regardless of how little we are, how low we are, how impure we are, how unholy we are, how sick, how afflicted we are. The law of God's Spirit by His Word makes it obey Him, forces the issue and says, give it back. And then Brother Brenham says, Amen. I mean, 
we would do well if we sometimes would give free rein to our inner agreement and would really once say a hallelujah and an amen to direct statements which touch us so deeply. I expect that we are seized by the word and are newly revived by the Spirit and blossom out in the presence of God. Yes, that new life comes forth. Job belonged to those who put their trust in God. In chapter 19, 25, he already said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. Despite of all what came upon him, in his heart, it was deeply anchored. He didn't look on that, what his eyes saw. He looked on the living God, of whom he said, Though the skin worms destroy my body, yet in my flesh I will see God. What a testimony, regardless of what happened around him. In chapter 33, verse 23, he spoke of the mediator, of the advocate, of one among thousands who gives back his righteousness to man and who intercedes for him and says to him, Deliver him from going down to the pit. Already in the Old Testament, he had the view for the redemption, for God's plan of salvation. Don't think that the prophets were blind and just spoke of things. They had already the view for that what would come and they just searched at what time it would come to fulfillment. They have not seen it. We have experienced it and we may thank God for it. Now something very strange is said here. Regardless how little we are, how low, how impure, how unholy, how sick, how afflicted we are. The law of God's Spirit, by His Word, makes it obey Him, forces the issue and says, give it back. God has spoken the word. He cannot take it back again. He can only fulfill it, namely on them who believed it. By grace we are part of them. Brother Brenham continues, Some people get so guilty-minded that they don't want to face any judgment. They are so afraid of death that they lose their mind. Others make inconsiderate decisions. There are two very different feelings of guilt. The one comes by the Spirit of God who leads us to repentance. This repentance does not end up in despair but in a conversion, in a turning towards God, in an experience with God. And then there is a consciousness of guilt which the accuser of the brethren causes to enslave us and to bring us into despair. Here we must distinguish and place ourselves onto the side of God and receive the redemption by faith as final for us. Brother Brenham continues and says, The law is his own law. His own life is behind it. That's the reason he swore by himself, for there is none greater. He had to take an oath Cause no covenant could be confirmed without an oath. This we can read in Hebrews, 
Because God could not swear by anyone else, he swore by himself. The new covenant he introduced by the blood of the Lamb and declared it to be final for us. I read on. There was no other way. Only he could do it by taking everything upon himself and stepped in for us. God became man through his death, through his burial and his resurrection. He proved that his law is in force. We are dealing with two different laws. The law of the letter, which leads to condemnation and death, and the law of the Spirit, which leads out of death into life. We are in the new covenant. God atoned sin. He has forgiven sin and has given us eternal life. We continue to read here. He knew the law of God and its effectiveness. He knew it had to work according to the word. For the word of God had been spoken through the prophet who said, I will not suffer my Holy One to see corruption. That settled it. The law of God got to work by the word. For the law of God is in his word. I hope that we don't stumble at the term law. What Brother Brenham wanted to say is the following, that in the natural and in the spiritual, everything was determined in the Word of God, anchored like in a law. Brother Brenham has given the fishes in the sea and the birds in the sky as an example. God created living conditions there that are so different from each other. But everything for the certain area, everything after its kind, everything in an order, and it has lasted to this day. Everything what was predicted in the Word of God in reference to Christ has been fulfilled to the last letter. What did we say? If Dr. Larkin counted right, 109 prophecies of the Scripture were fulfilled at the first coming of Christ. It was written where he would be born. Of his ministry, everything was written, up to the mocking and scoffing, up to that, that lots would be cast over his garment. Everything was written. It was anchored in the Word of God. And the Word of God is like a law. Nothing could be changed about it. It was fulfilled as the Lord has said it. In the same way, we may believe that everything what God promised in His Word as it was anchored in a divine code of law, it cannot be moved or changed. It is settled once and for all and will have to run accordingly. We read on, the Holy Spirit is here to enforce this law for the believer. The Holy Spirit takes the word, lays it into the heart of the believer, comes upon them as the power of God to enforce the promise through them. What a wonderful example. Brother Brenham gives here a comparison. Listen to it. But you got to have the badge of a believer and have to be ordained for it. Somebody may say, 
you got power. No, but authority. We ain't got any power to do something, but we do have the authority for it. This is a vast difference. And he gives an example, which I will also read now. Some time ago, I saw a policeman here in Louisville, standing there. His head was pulled down over his ears, his uniform about half hanging off of him. But when he blowed his whistle, the cars stopped. What was it? It was not the power of the man. It was the position which he had, his area of responsibility, what he is entitled to, he carried it out. You know, in America, the traffic is sometimes at the junctions controlled and regulated by policemen. This poor man could not even lift up a car. He would go on his knees if it was about power. He didn't have it. But he had something what represented the government. He had a uniform on, one blow with a whistle, and all stepped on the brake. Here, Brother Brennan wants to clearly show, children of God, they have no power in themselves with what you could bring about something. But you received power. You received authority. You received the word. You received the spirit. Don't look on yourself. Look on the position into which you were placed in the presence of God. Brother Brenham continues, It wasn't the power of the man. It was the authority he had. That's how it is with the church. Not power. That somebody comes and says, I have power to do this or that. No, the Lord says, I give you power, full power, authority over all the power of Satan, that we can cast out devils and so forth. Now he says here, regardless of the conditions, God's law works with his word. It will work with the word. It just works with the word according to the faith. Not according to a creed, but according to the faith. In the kingdom of God, all things are based upon the foundation of faith. Therefore Jesus said, To them who believe, these signs shall follow. He who does not believe, him they cannot follow. To the believer they must follow. It continues, Already since Pentecost, the people tried to suppress the church and call them names as holy rollers and fanatics. The church walks on. God is going to use her. That's just as certain as I'm standing here. We are coming right down now to the end of the age. May God help me that I can show and prove it to you where we are at. The church is not going to be destroyed. It is impossible. Take your hands off of her. Also here, we are strengthened in the faith. Brother Brenham says, the church walks on. And even it's very slow. And sometimes we feel like a standstill. Nevertheless, it is preparation for what God plans to do with us. For standstill would be decline and this God may prevent. We are told here of the church, God is going to use her. That's as certain as I'm standing here. So we not only heard, 
we received promises which concern us and that what God wants to do in the church by the restoration. God is going to use her. That's as certain as I'm standing here. Not only Brother Brenham as the messenger of God, but also the church which believes with all the heart and serves the Lord, being obedient to Him and follows Him. He says, that's as certain as I'm standing here. There's no clearer way of expressing it. Who should still doubt it now? Perhaps we think everything is already over. The film is finished, the end is here. All right, if it's here, we cannot change it. But I believe that God at the end restores his church back into the same condition in which she was at the beginning. And here we are told, God's going to use her. That's just as certain as I'm standing here. Even many years have passed. And what I don't hope, but if more years pass by, this wouldn't change anything about it, that God will nevertheless do it. I read on. God talking of restoring. We have read the text from the prophet Joel. I preached on this once before and took it in another angle, but I never thoroughly went through it as I intend to do today. God is speaking here in Joel of his fruit tree that he had planted. God planted a fruit tree on the day of Pentecost. This tree he planted there for a purpose. He wanted it to bear his fruit, the fruit of the Word of God. He wanted a church that would keep his Word all down through the age. If we speak here now of the bearing of fruit and of this tree, and if it's compared with a church, then we must understand today that we don't bear our fruits, but the fruit of God, the fruits of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We don't come to God to bring Him something. We come to God to receive gifts from Him, to take something with. And we were ordained to bear fruit, His fruit, at its time. This tree He planted for a purpose. He wanted it to bear His fruit, the fruit of the Word, not own fruit. And also about this Brother Brenham spoke. All denominations bring forth after their own kind, but in the church of the living God can only be brought forth after divine kind, sons and daughters of God who were born again from the seed of the Word by the Spirit. And then the fruit of the Word of God comes forth. He wanted a church that would keep his word all down through the age. To this, we must say that throughout all the ages his word was broken. But he always had a message and people who believed and received his message. And they were the ones whom God helped. Their disobedience was replaced by obedience and their unbelief by belief and they were brought back to God. It continues here, the tree that God planted should bear nine different kinds of fruit and nine gifts of the Spirit. The nine fruits of the Spirit and the nine gifts of the Spirit 
belong together. This is the tree of God. He planted it on the day of Pentecost here on earth. What a wonderful statement. Everybody who read 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 knows that there it speaks of nine gifts of the Spirit. Everyone who read Galatians 5 knows that there it speaks of nine fruits of the Spirit. Here we are told the tree that God planted, it should bear nine different kinds of fruit and nine gifts of the Spirit. So, we see now where things were taken away from the tree. It became a bold tree. It was eaten away here and there. Only a withered tree is left. But God promised to restore, to revive, and when this refreshing comes, then the divine tree must be restored into its original condition as it was at the beginning. Then the nine fruits of the Spirit and the nine gifts of the Spirit must be there. That's how we read it here. Bearing nine different kinds of fruit and nine gifts of the Spirit. Just one question. We are among ourselves. Do we all believe with all our hearts that this is in the will of God? That a church will be at the end restored back into the same condition as she was at the beginning. Do we all believe it? Do we believe that this includes all gifts and all fruits of the Spirit? Then we have to believe that this is only possible through an outpouring of the Holy Spirit as it was at the beginning. 100%. We won't be able to produce it. But God will bring forth the Word in us which we received by His Spirit. Perhaps I should read quickly from Galatians 5 these verses, although I assume that they are well known to all of us. Maybe I will read beforehand so that we can see the difference and know what belongs to the old man and what then belongs to the new man. From verse 19 Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts, have given it into death, so that Christ can live his life through us. The one is the showing of the old man, the other is the new man, in whom the fruits of the Spirit are manifest. Not the old fruits of the flesh, but the new fruits of the Spirit. In Romans, in chapter 1, Paul has described already the old condition 
and the people shown as follows. From verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they who commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Here the condition of the old man is described. Today it is for us to know what God has promised to us in His Word and with what we can count now. I read on. David saw this tree long time ago. He sang the Psalms. They were written down and we enjoy it. He saw the tree planted by the riverside. A man planted like a tree of God by the rivers. Rivers, not in singular, but plural. Nine gifts of the Spirit and nine fruits of the Spirit come forth from the same fountain. He is like a tree that's planted by the rivers of waters. David saw it and said, Blessed is that man. This tree cannot die. His leaves do not wither. The tree cannot die, no matter what happens, because he is planted by the rivers of water. For the life remains in the roots. Humanly seen, the church in the drought, and especially during the dark age, she would have been destroyed long ago and would have ceased to exist. But God, in every age, kept a seed. He always had people who heard His voice, who believed His word. Here it continues. If He is laughed at and mocked and persecution comes upon Him, it makes Him to pray more and He gets a better hold so that he can stand the storms. Now, such a man who is planted by these rivers of water is fed by it and is established firmly. Such a man has part in the fruits and gifts of the Holy Spirit, like the gift of healing, prophecy and so forth. There are many gifts, but the same Spirit and the same Giver. Do we count with it, I ask once again, whether God will do all this once more? I am aware of that we also experienced disappointments and that things were impersonated and went wrong. But this does not mean that God at the end will not put a body together who is totally under the leading of the Holy Spirit, where nobody comes with his own intentions, with his own plans to the service, but that everybody waits in the presence of God, whether it concerns a ministry or a gift, until the divine inspiration comes and that the Lord can bless and use us just as He promised it. Here, 
we are told such a man has part in the fruits and gifts of the Holy Spirit like the gift of healing, prophecy and so forth. There are many gifts but the same Spirit and the same giver. And here Brother Brenham speaks probably at some places about the thought that the last church age merges into the bright age so that at the end from the church age a bride comes forth in which God can bless even more than he blessed during the church age. And this makes me actually believe, namely based on the fact that God, through the ministry of Brother Brenham, did more than through all the ministries within the Pentecostal Church, when it's about the raising of the dead, about creation miracles, then nobody else can show it. There are things in the ministry of Brother Brenham which did not happen in any other ministry. And if he was the prophet of God who was sent in this last age to address a message to the overall church, knowing, as the Holy Scripture says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the church. These are then the overcomers. And these overcomers, before their translation and rapture, they will have to experience the quickening power of God. And then will happen what will go beyond what happened during the Pentecostal revival. Take me on that day when it happens at my word. But not only that, we want to take God at his word. And then we see in the early church whether the handkerchiefs or aprons of a Paul, whether the shadow of a Peter, oh, all kinds of things happened. Should God, when he restores, do less than he has done then? Most certainly not. He will give us a full measure of the Spirit and of the power. Before we leave this thought, I would like to hear from you whether you can believe that the Lord God, right at the end, in the called out multitude, once more will do great, yes, greater things than of what happened until now. Can you believe it? With all your heart, this is the truth. God promised it in his word and it will take place. It continues here. This tree does not lose its fruit, but if a tree is without water, the fruit withers. That's how it is with the churches today. This is also a very important statement. The fruit might be still here, but it is beggarly. It is not how it should be, but God will revive and a wonderful fruit will be found on this tree. He continues here, You have got away from dead rivers of water, from the gifts of the Spirit. It is just a church natural. And they get away from the spiritual gifts and the spiritual fruits and bring forth their own fruit. Here he describes exactly our condition. A church in which not the fruits and gifts of the Spirit are manifest. A church that is withered. A church in which the fruit is withered. A church in which the gifts are withered. But God promised, I will restore. 
I will refresh. I will give you back what the canker worm and so forth has eaten up. It continues here. What do they do? Although they are believers, they act like the world. They steal, cheat, lie, smoke, drink, gamble, having parties. They don't bring any fruit. They are just like the world. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, in chapter 17, Ye are not of this world, even as I am not of this world. Paul writes in one of his letters, You do not enjoy the same pleasure with them, and they marvel at you. Why not? We have come out to not walk again on the broad way. Here, the church is shown, which now is described as the natural church, in which is no more the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, but self-made things are brought forth. Beloved, we don't have to go far from here. How much self-made has been produced as a substitute for that which was wrought by the Spirit of God. And with that we fell on our nose. But God, by His grace, He will raise us up again. He will take us off this ash heap. And He will give grace that we in all things have the fear of God. Whether it concerns the preaching, whether it concerns the operation of the gifts, whatever takes place in the kingdom of God. Firstly, the fear of God must come upon us, and only then we come into the stand in which God can bless us and make us a blessing, producing nothing of our own, and then perhaps even say, Thus saith the Lord. But waiting whether God speaks, and when He speaks, with fear and trembling, on divine command, passing on what we received from Him. I expect that a working of the Spirit comes in the same clarity as the message, as the teaching, without any if and but. We know that it's right. We know that it's correct, not because we brought it, but because God has given it to us. We would not be foolish enough to think that we can hold something to our credit. No, it is the fear of God which kept us within the limits of the Word of God. And as the prophet of God, had to walk and preach within the limits of the Word, so we today have to teach and believe within the limits of the Word of God. And so today we have to make ourselves available to God within the limits of the Word of God, so that a genuine working of the Holy Spirit can be manifested. Nobody who could do it himself. Let me read quickly here. Did you get it? Psalms 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Here is described to us the condition of a man who was planted by God as a tree at the rivers of water, a person on whom God did great things. Of him it continues to say, He brings forth his fruit in his season. Here his 
is written in capital letters. So, the fruit of God at God's time. As we heard, we don't bear our own fruit. We bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. He brings forth His fruit in His season. Watch the personal pronoun here. It is His fruit, God's fruit, in the season in which the word of prophecy goes forth. It is in the prophet's season in which God's fruit in God's time comes forth. He brings forth His fruit in His season, God's fruit at the right time, in the season that the messenger is ordained to come. Remember, the fruit of God comes in God's season when the messenger comes on the scene and the fruit cannot wither. Why? Because it's a predestinated fruit and therefore it can also not be destroyed. I didn't read this passage twice. It is written twice. It's an emphasis. Here it should be emphasized that in that period of time in which God sends the messenger with the prophetic word, a call will go forth and an exodus of the children of God will take place. People who have the fear of God, fear before His word, His servants, his doings, and most of all, fear before what happens in the kingdom of God. And thus, the fear of God is then also the beginning of the divine wisdom. This I like to read again now, and with it I come to a close. It is the prophet's season in which God's fruit comes forth in God's season not in your and my season, not when you or I want it, or when we want it. God had his time to bring the message. And about 20 years ago, we have already believed in a very short time, everything will be over. If someone had told me at that time, it would take 20 years, I would have accused him of being an unbeliever and would have said, Brother, may God open your eyes. How grateful we can be that God does not let us know time and hour. What a privilege that he reserved time and hour for himself. And there will be no person, not even an angel in heaven, who would know this time or who could tell it. It says here, it is the prophet's season in which God's fruit comes forth in God's time. He brings forth his fruit in his season, God's fruit at the right time, in the season that the messenger is ordained to come. So. First, the messenger had to come on the scene and bring the message. Afterwards, it had to be carried into all the world to give the people or the believers the opportunity to have knowledge of it, to either accept it or reject it. And only then comes the time period in which God will let come forth the fruit. It is not sown and harvested. It is sown and then waited and then harvested. Everything at the right time. And Job, or James was it, who wrote of Job, and he said, the farmer waiteth for the fruit of the field until it receives the former and the latter rain. 
also we are waiting for it, that after the prophetic message, in this prophetic age, a blessing comes upon the church that goes beyond what could be heard and seen until now. I can believe it. It would fit to God if He, at the end, would give great glory to His name by the great things which He will do that will go beyond our imagination. I just would like to read one word from the Holy Scripture. I hope that I find it, where Paul writes that he is able to do more than we can think. Who knows where it's written? Tell me quickly. Who knows where it is written? Huh. Here we have it. Thanks be to God. Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 20. Yeah. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. How wonderful! To him who has the power, he has the power. He has said, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. He gave promises. He has the power to fulfill them. Let us believe that he will do it and we will see it fulfilled. Blessed and praised be his name. Amen. Let us come to the front and worship.